Coming to 2021, Indonesia is the largest emerging country in Southeast Asia, especially in their digital economy. Among 12 digital unicorns in Southeast Asia, Indonesia occupied four of them, Gojek, Traveloka, Tokopedia, and Bukalapa. And these four unicorns have a combined valuation of over 30 billion US dollars. Even Malaysian only unicorn, our Grab, has moved to Singapore. There's always been comparison between Indonesia and Malaysia. These two neighboring nations time to time compete economically, but at the same time, we share too many similarities from our national language, official religions, and today, history. Today, I want to talk about the similarities and differences of uh, Chinese Indonesian and Chinese Malaysian. Hi, my name is Ivan, and welcome to another video of Fearless Passport. In the past two years, I spent quite some time working between Malaysia and Indonesia. And I want to share with you my observation of both Chinese Malaysian and Chinese Indonesian in a short form called Chindo today. Before I make it to Indonesia, I used to have some kind of uh, stereotypes towards the Chindos. In my impressions, I thought all of them, the Chinese Indonesians, are very rich. All of them cannot speak, write, nor read any of the Mandarin. And in my opinion, probably a lot of Chinese mainlanders and a lot of uh, Chinese Malaysians' opinion as well, it is a pity because they cannot preserve their ancestral culture like we do. But the truth is always surprising. Believe it or not, even after so much of discrimination in their past history, Chinese Indonesians are much more patriotic and more of a nationalist compared to the rest of the Chinese in the rest of the world. In my opinion, to understand this, we have to look at their history. Do you know Indonesia has the largest Chinese populations out of China, Taiwan and Hong Kong? Official figures state that there's only about 3 million Chinese Indonesian, making about 1.2 of the total populations, but the actual figures could be up to 7.2 million. One reason of the discrepancy is that over the years, there has been a lot of intermarrying between the Chinese and the local Indonesian groups, making it difficult to define what a Chinese really means. Another reason is, some might find it very reluctant to identify their ethnic groups. In Malaysia, although the Chinese Malaysian make up about 20% of the populations, but number-wise, it is about 6.4 million people. Compared to Chinese Indonesian, we are at about 1 million differences. Same like the Chinese Malaysian, the Chinese population in Indonesia started to expand especially between 1870 to 1930 under the ruling of Dutch colon known as Dutch East India Company VOC. Back then, most of the Chinese took part in major economic roles such as traders, skilled laborers, and middlemen between the natives and colonizers. So here's the problem. The Dutch split the Indonesia's social hierarchy into three levels with the Dutch on the top, Chinese in the middle, and native at the bottom. Over the years, the stereotypes that the Chinese controlling the Indonesia economy were imprinted way too long. The largest cultural assimilation were done during the 32 years long reign of Suharto, which is the second president of Indonesia. For the Chinese, the development of local Chinese society and culture is based on three pillars. First, the clan association, which is Ke Jia Hui Guan, or Cao Zhou Hui Guan, Fu Zhou Hui Guan, etc. Ethnic media, which is newspaper, and also the Chinese language school. During Suharto years, he placed rigid restrictions to wipe off Chinese identity on Chinese who chose to become Indonesian citizens. In 1967, presidential decree banned Chinese news celebrations and Chinese arts. New order law closed about 629 Chinese schools. All Chinese cultural and religious expressions, including the display of Chinese characters, were prohibited from public space. Ethnic Chinese were forced to abort their Chinese surname and take up Indonesian sounding names. The term China is considered very discriminating. The ruling of Suharto was long. 32 years was long enough to dismantle the three important pillars of Chinese ethnics. The assimilation to the so-called Chinese problem was a success. That is why most of the Chinese Indonesian now, except the older generations, they cannot speak, read, nor even write formal Mandarin. Some of them only communicate their local dialects at home, mostly Hakka and also Hokkien. So was that a pity? For people like me who are privileged enough to preserve my ancestral culture and keep my name, to be honest, I used to feel very sorry for my Indonesian counterparts. But what I found, but what I eventually found is that people are very happy and assimilated very well in the colorful Indonesian culture. 
people are very proud to be Indonesian. And let me share a personal story with you. Just before the National Day, everyone around me, my colleagues, they were talking about it, they were talking about it very excitedly. And on their National Day itself, on the 17th of August, everyone would wake up early, dress up formally, gather together and sing the National Anthem. And that was what happening at the place that I work. I mean, everybody is very serious about their Independence Day. As opposed to Malaysian, of course we are very happy with our Hari Kemerdekaan. But I guess the most of us would probably sleep through the day and posting maybe Happy Hari Merdeka on Instagram. From the outsider perspective, because we are so used to see people with our own point of view, we used to think, for example, North Koreans are doomed, the Chinese mainlanders has no rights to express against their government. In this case, the Chinese Indonesian lose their ancestral language, but in their day-to-day -day life, they don't really need formal Mandarin to communicate. And from what I researched, more than 65% of Chinese Indonesian, they speak Indonesian at home. So they don't really feel the urge to learn the language. So who are we to judge, right? And after the fall of Suharto in 1998, President Habibie removed the legislations that required the terms pre-bumi and non-pre-bumi, which is native and uh, Indonesian non-native. The next president, Abdurrahman Wahid, recalled the legislations that forbid the practice of Chinese culture and then he permit the use of Chinese Mandarin in public. Two years later, Indonesian 5th President Megawati Sukarno Putri declared Chinese New Year a national holiday known as Imlek. Today, Indonesian constitution does not differentiate between the native Indonesian citizens and citizens of foreign origins. In their Article 27 says that all citizens shall have equal status before the law. Both native Indonesians and naturalized people like the Chinese Indonesians enjoy equal rights before the law. All of them considered as Wen Yi, which is Waga Negara, Indonesia. All Wen Yi has equal rights to exercise businesses, equal education opportunity, no favors of any ethnic or special treatment. Now, let's take a look at Malaysia. In the Malaysia constitutions, there are at least two articles Articles 153 and Articles 160 that states the responsibility for safeguarding the special positions of the Malays and natives of Sabah and Sarawak. Though all Malaysians, we enjoy unity, peace and harmony, but political-wise, we were still separated by the Bumiputra and non-Bumiputra status. In front of the law, we are not equals in purchasing a real estate. That is not equal education opportunity. That is quota to enroll into local university. We are not equals to purchase government bonds like the Amana Saham and there is booming putra ownerships in public listed companies. In short, the Chinese Malaysian and Indian Malaysian and other non-native races, we are not always equals before the law compared to the natives. But of course this video is not meant to spread hate. I want to emphasize that despite the non-native are restricted constitutionally, all Malaysians are treated quite well by other races. We are very privileged to maintain our culture, observe our religions and speak our language. Perhaps this is not always possible in Indonesia itself. So, if you happen to be Indonesian one day, the word China to describe an Indonesian with ethnic Chinese is still quite sensitive. I used to make such mistake as well, because in Malaysia we are okay with Uncle China, which is the Chinese uncle, or Kedai China, which is a Chinese shop. But in Indonesia, it's better to swap the word China with the word Tionghua, which means Chinese descent, and describe China as Tiongkok. If you see someone who speaks Chinese openly in Indonesia, that's probably a Totok. That means those who have migrated from China recently. And the Chinese Indonesians, the Chindos we've been talking about, they are the Peranakan. The word Peranakan literally means child of the land. Usually you can kind of guess their ethnicity in their last name. During Suharto time where ethnic Chinese require to adopt Indonesian sounding name, our Chinese Indonesian ancestors are very smart to hide their surname into the back of an Indonesian sounding name. For example, one with the surname Lin, Lin in Mandarin, Cantonese is called Lam. Uh, Hokkien is called Lim. They might adopt the name like Limanto, some adopt Ha Lim. Ha with a Lim at the back is actually Lim with a Chinese surname. So Ha Lim, Sa Lim, uh, Muslim, Limawan and etc. They probably have the Chinese surname as Lin. 
another famous last name such as Tanjong, Tanojo, Tanjaya, etc. with the prefix Tan could be someone from Chen in Mandarin. And the last name with prefix uh, Ang, like Angkia, Angkasa, Agriawan, most likely have the surname Hong, because Hong in Hokkien dialect is uh, sound as Ang. Another famous Chinese surname is Huang, Huang in Hokkien is called Wei or Wei, which is often hidden into Wijaya, Widodo, Riyono, Wijaya, Winata, and many more. So it's very interesting. When I was in Indonesia, I was constantly guessing their last name and constantly guessing their last name in my head. And if I guess it right, it's like a bingo moment. In conclusion, population migration is nothing new today. Due to the wars and poverty in the old days and even today like the recent uh, Israel and Palestine issues, people would move to a better place for survival. Even in United States, most if not all of the white Americans, they all have European ancestry. So I don't see a reason why we should discriminate each other in a land that's supposed to be someone else's because there is no land in today's world really belongs to a certain groups of people and for many immigrants like asian americans african americans chinese malaysian like me and chinese indonesian whosoever the fact of matter is that most of us come from second or even third for me i'm the fourth generations of the family people were born here we all grew up here and we have pride of the country that we all identify ourselves with the feeling is there we love our country everyone work as hard as anyone else and the last thing we need to do is to fight among ourselves about how certain ethnicity or skin color supposedly to own the land or entitle the land more than the others last but not least i am very proud to be an anak malaysia really so share with me in the comments that what you think of today's video. Do you know about your ancestry and which generations are you in the country? Show me a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel Fearless Passport, turn on all for the notifications for more authentic travel stories. Follow me on Instagram as well as I also share things that I learned along my backpacking journey in the bite size. So thank you for watching. Bye.